of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle, put it under a bushel, put on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Verse number 16 says, Let your light shine, so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father that is in heaven. Lord, we just ask you right now that you would help me to express what you have for this congregation today. That Lord, I don't want to fill a time slot. Lord, I don't want to just bring a, a, a good idea. But Lord, I pray that you would speak through me today. And Lord, let there be a direct word. And I pray that you would go before and till the ground. And Lord, let there be fertile ground for this land, oh God. We give you the praise for what you're doing in our lives, what you're going to do in the remainder of this service. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We worship you in Jesus' name. And then you may be seated for those that are standing. Man, this is a topic that uh, one may say is elementary uh, in the sense that it's not very deep in thought. And that's okay because I believe that we need to scratch the surface and, and we will dive deeper into it. But I believe there's something that uh, we need to continuously be reminded of no matter if you've been in church uh, five weeks or five years or 50 years. It's something that we need to continually keep before us to be reminded of is that we are a light in a dark world. Man, it's a simple thought. There's a song that, it's an older song, I remember Brother Erod used to sing it all the time, in the quartet that says, uh, I thank God for the lighthouse. Man, it's a, it's a good Southern Gospel song for those like myself that like Southern Gospel, and those that don't, you're just missing out. I'm sorry about that. I'll pray for you. Yeah. But no, there really is a powerful, powerful song when you think about it, because if you understand the dynamic of what a lighthouse did, and what a lighthouse's purpose was, was to, as a ship was out at sea and it began, it began to get dark and cloudy or foggy, um, a brother, brother Jeremy was just showing, a, a Jeremy and Scott, Jeremy Lauer, right down in Florida, he was just showing me a picture last night of when they were out on the ocean, and he, he kind of took pictures all the way around, and you really couldn't see any land at all where you were when they were out in the ocean. And so as you are out in life's sea, as you will, and you're out in the ocean and, and things are coming your way and it's starting to get dark and starting to get cloudy in the in an area that you're surrounded by, it's always nice, there's always a comfort to know that there's a lighthouse on the shore that is shining bright to be a guide for you, to be a place of safety that you can look at that's consistent, it doesn't change, it's always in the location and you know that it's going to lead you to safety. Amen. Amen. In this world there is a cloudiness that has taken place. In this world there is a darkness that has set upon. I mean it's always been a dark world but I think none could argue in this place that scripturally backed up that this world is becoming darker. Amen. And the spirit realm it's becoming darker. Yes. Yeah. And so more than ever, more than even in Matthew 5 when Jesus was talking to the, to the people there and when he was given the Sermon on the Mount, uh, more than that even, I believe that there is a need for a beacon of light, a lighthouse to stand and be a representative of the kingdom of God. To say that, listen, I am here and I have a plan and it's for you. The Lord is saying that to his people and he's sending out the light and it's going to be through us. We are the light Amen. that is set on a hill now. We are, how many ever heard that uh, the old old saying that we're the only Jesus that people see. Yeah. Man, that's a true statement. Because as people are walking through this world of darkness and there's cloudiness and there's uh, turmoil and there's a lot of uncertainty, it is important that we remain focused inward on Jesus Christ so that we can be a direct reflection of who He is right. in our action and in our deeds. Yeah. Amen. I believe God is calling us to be that beacon of hope to this world. We need the beacon of hope, but we're to be the representative of that. Yeah. If our vision is far, what did, I, what did I teach a couple weeks ago? Without a vision, the people perish. If they can't see where they're going, if they can't understand what the process is, they perish. We are the light that is set on a hill. And then he commanded us in verse 16 of Matthew 5 that I just read. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. Amen. It's very important that we grasp that. In verse number four, uh, chapter number four of the same book, Matthew chapter four, we read about 
beginning of Jesus calling men to be a representative of himself. This is the beginning where he started to call his disciples. They were, uh, and as all accounts would say, they were perfectly fine in their life. They were going above, above uh, among their life, doing the same things that they'd always done. They were fishing, they were fishermen, they were providing for their family, they were just doing uh, their job. And Jesus came out of the blue and showed them something greater. Now listen, if I have a job that is paying me well and I'm providing for my family, and someone comes up to me that I don't know and says, you need to quit your job and come and do what I tell you to do. My natural logic is going to be like, okay, buddy. We'll see you later. But I think that there was something significant the fact that they just dropped their nets and followed him. What was it that was so significant? I think they recognized that there was something unique about Jesus Christ. That the way he spoke with authority, the way he presented himself, he said, listen, I've got a way that's greater than the way you're living. I've got a plan that's better than the plan you are on right now. And he said, Come, I called you out to become fishers of men. Bible says that if any man come after me, let him first take up his cross and follow me. Amen. He called the fishermen. He asked them to leave what would supply their need to follow him. And trust that he would supply their need. Man, he's called us today to be that. And I, I preached a message a long time ago, and I'm just going to touch on it for a minute. He called us to be fishers of men. Isaiah 5 and 13 talks about how this world is, you know, we just talked about how the world is getting dark and how everything around us is getting worse. It was actually prophesied in Isaiah that this was going to happen. Why did he say we need to be fishers of men? And I'll tell you exactly why. If you go to Isaiah 5 and verse number 13, he says, Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. I talked a couple weeks ago about having a knowledge of him. They have no knowledge, which means they did not see him. They do not understand him. They have no knowledge of him. And it says, so they were taken into captivity and bondage, and their honorable men vanished, and the multitude dried up with thirst. In verse 14, a very, very uh, alarming scripture, okay? It says, therefore, hell hath enlarged herself, and opened up her mouth without measure. And their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoices shall descend into it. When I read this again, something happened to me. I'm not okay with people going to hell. Amen. Amen. I'm not okay with it. Anymore. And I'm not saying I ever was, but there's people going to hell in my circle of influence that I've never talked to about Jesus Christ. This is real, okay? This is as real as it's going to get. There are people around us that need us to be the light that is shining forth. Being a representative of Jesus Christ. He's called us to be fishers of what? Why? Because men are going into the lake of fire daily. Let that sink in for a minute. They had no knowledge of him. So hell enlarged itself. That should not be in our circles and in our families. I'm guilty. I'm not pointing fingers. Let me take the beam out of my own eye. Telling you that this is real. We don't hear enough. I'm not talking about in our church, but in the church in general. We don't hear enough about what people's eternity is going to be if they choose to not follow Christ. Yeah. I'm not okay with it. And I've got to change to make it better. So this is what I want to talk to you today. I don't want to just tell you you need to be a light and tell you that you need to impact the world. I want to tell you a little bit about how I feel like God is calling us to, to do that. In Ezekiel 22 or 30, I won't read it, but he just said that he's looking for someone to stand in the gap. But he found no one. What a depressing scripture. What is that scripture? I don't want it to be said of our church or our congregation, that if he were to call us to do something, that he would find no one. Amen. Right, sir. Sister Lindsay put on Facebook, I've actually probably preached about it a dozen times. She put a post on there two years, three years ago, I don't know, but she said, I feel like I'm busy all the time that I'm not doing anything that really matters. Okay? Talked about that a couple times. But think about it. Are you so busy with life that you're not taking time to be an example and a representative of the kingdom of God. Amen. It's, 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 Amen. 
defined in 2 Corinthians. I'm setting the foundation and then I'm going to dive into what I feel like we need to do and some of the characteristics of a representative of God in just a minute. But in 2 Corinthians, if you go there, it's a scripture I've read several times also. But he says that for God, verse number 6 of 2 Corinthians 4. Actually, I'm going to start verse number 3. Sorry, God. Uh, verse number 3 says, But if our gospel is hid, be hid, it is hid to who? Them that are lost. Those who need the light. If we hide this gospel, I'm not hiding it from you. You know where Jesus is. We're hiding it from this world. If we are ashamed of this gospel, if we hide this gospel, if we're not even ashamed of it, but we just are so busy, we don't take the time to share it. We are hiding it to, we're not necessarily doing a detriment to us. Because we see it. We see the revelation. But we're doing a huge disservice to those that are around us. And then that is a very important thing because he called us to be fishers of men. And then it's important to me that we understand this. And whom the God of this world, talking about the devil, has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest why? Why did he blind them? Why is he trying to put fog in their way? Why is he trying to make it dark around them? Because he said, Lest they, the light of this glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The enemy has one goal, and that is to keep the light from getting to, to us and to get into them. He has come here to do what? To steal, to kill, to destroy. What is he stealing? Right. He's stealing the revelation of who Jesus is. What is he trying to kill? He's trying to kill our walk and our relationship with Jesus Christ. What is he trying to destroy? The kingdom of God. Yeah. Amen. So it is hid to them that are lost. And the enemy is trying to enhance that, enlarge his borders, if you will, by making people blind so that they don't see the light of this glorious gospel. It says, verse number 6, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's given us the light now. Okay? He called the light out of darkness. Who is the light? Jesus said, I am the light. He called him out of darkness. There was a dark world and he brought back the place where we can come boldly down to the throne of grace. Okay? And then he shined it in our hearts. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the, the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And then finally, for, as far as the foundation is concerned, and I'm going to talk about in 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 17. He says this, he says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, and I talked about this last time I preached, but it ties in very well with this. He says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Okay, aren't you thankful for your salvation? Aren't you thankful that you are not who you once were? And aren't you thankful that when you slip back into it, there's forgiveness of sin? That we can become brand new. His mercies are new. How often? Every year? No, every single morning. You can wake up every morning and have a brand new mercy. And His grace is sufficient. And His strength is made perfect when we're weak. That's what the, that's what the Bible says. So He says that we are a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things become new. What a wonderful thing. We have the right to shout about that. Amen. Amen. We ought to be rejoicing in our salvation. That we want amazing grace. How sweet the sound. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Oh, yeah. Amen. It's a beautiful thing that we've been found. It's a wonderful thing we've been healed. It's a wonderful thing we've been delivered. And I'm not trying to shortchange that at all. Because it's a wonderful thing that's happened to us. That God loved us so much that he died. Got that? Amen. Amen. It's beautiful. But what good is the cure of AIDS? I've, I've used this example before. If someone gives me the cure for AIDS, they write the formula down on a piece of paper, and I take that, I'm all excited about it, because I now have the cure that's going to cure hundreds and thousands of people that are dying, but then I take that piece of paper and I fold it up and I put it in my pocket, and then I wash my jeans and I never see that, I just throw it away, I never do anything with it. What good was that cure? Yeah. Or what good is the if I fold it up and I keep it in my, I keep it close to my heart. I keep it in the pocket of my shirt, and I love this the fact that I know this. I have this understanding. What good is it if I don't take it to the people that can do something with it and change people's lives? Yeah. Amen. Amen. 
And what good is this gospel if we keep it to ourselves and we don't go share it with those that need it? Because there is a lost and a dying and a dark and a hurting world that we are surrounded by on a daily basis that needs what we have. And if we truly believe that we have the answers, we believe Jesus. How many would say Jesus is the answer for the world today? And that we all believe that. I don't think anyone would be here today if we didn't believe that Jesus was the answer. But the answer was is for us, but it's also to them that the Bible says that he gave that scared spirit. But in Acts 2.38, we like to talk about that. But he says, but this gift is not just for them, but it's to, to as many as far off, even as the Lord our God shall call. Man. So he says that we're a new preacher. Behold, uh, all things are, are, are of God. He reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ and have given us the ministry of reconciliation on 2 Corinthians 5, going into verse number 19. He says, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses on them. He had committed unto the, the word, he's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Okay, I talked about this a couple weeks ago. He's given us the, the ministry of reconciliation. Okay? I talked about it a couple weeks ago and said we need to have a ministry of reconciliation, but I never really talked about what that meant. He says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. What did number 20 tell us to do? Saying that we are representatives in Christ's place to share this gospel. That's what that's saying. We're the ambassadors. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made righteousness of God in him. Okay. Uh, many years ago I did a study, I probably taught on it, maybe once or twice, and I'm going to talk about it over again today was the study of what an, of the role of an ambassador is. Okay? What are the characteristics of an ambassador? What is the purpose of an ambassador? Because it says that we are to be, it says now we are ambassadors for Christ. We are not Christ. We cannot say we are to be ambassadors for Christ. Okay? So if you look up the word ambassador in that scripture in the Strong's, it says to act as a representative. Pretty, pretty cut and dry. Nothing real uh, significant there. So we know that an ambassador, today even still, uh, if you've been involved in the military or you just know anything really about politics, uh, countries will send ambassadors to a foreign land to go be a representative of their kingdom. Okay? The role, the duty, the characteristics of an ambassador, uh, from what I can tell, can be summed up basically in seven different principles. And I'm going to just sit through those seven different principles real quick uh, and talk about those because I believe they're important that we take those in and we understand them. And I believe it's going to help us to do what I just talked about, to be a light to this world because it's going to give us a little bit of, uh, they had some rules they had to follow, they had some, uh, they had a mission that they were on, and they still do. They have rules that they got about that mission that they're on, and they've got some things that help define who they are as an ambassador. Number one, it says that they were sent to a foreign country to represent the ambition or culture of the king or kingdom from which they came. Okay? It's not about my mission. Listen. The ambassador is not to go about their own business. The ambassador has put their agenda to the side to go take on the agenda of their country. We're not of this world. We're pilgrims, we're foreigners in this, in this land, right? We're just passing through. We sing old Southern Gospel songs about that too. We're just passing through, okay? It is not our duty to push our agenda on people. The greatest example I can think of, I thought I was reading in the scriptures, and I know there's take up your cross and all these things, but the greatest example to follow in this as being an ambassador, of, of course, is Jesus Christ himself. Sure. He came in here, God manifest in the flesh, broke himself in flesh, and dwelt among us. Man, he said, he said a quote that we all should say. When they were trying to get him to do some other things, he said, I'm sorry, but I'm only here about my father's business. 
He wasn't getting too connected to Galilee. He wasn't getting too connected to Nazareth. He wasn't getting too connected to Jerusalem. He said, listen, I'm here on a mission. My mission is to seek and save that which was lost. The enemy may be coming to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So he said, I'm about my father's business. To the point that we read of Jesus praying in the garden. And he said, God, you know, he was praying, the spirit was praying for the, uh, the flesh, praying for the spirit. He said, I don't want to go through this. He said, I don't want to fight this. I don't want to hang on Calvary. I know what's about to come. I know, but I know that what you have for me is not for me, but it's for the world that's coming and the world that's been and the world that is. I've come to seek and save that which is lost. So he said, you know what? Not my will, Father, but yours be done. That is the first characteristic of an ambassador for Jesus Christ, the representative of the kingdom, is to say, Lord, not my will. This is how I want it. This is how I figured it out in my mind. And this is what I think it should be. But Lord, not my will, but yours be done. I'm sure Jesus Christ thought to himself at one point, like, surely there's another way. Surely it's, there's something besides Calvary that I can do to save these people. But not my will, God. Well, God, what if I did this, this, and this? Would that be okay? Would that suffice? But not my will, God. Yours be done. If you are going to be an ambassador or a representative of the kingdom of God, you must first get the mentality to say that I cannot be about my own business, but I've got to be about my father's business. Amen. And because of what Jesus did in the garden, he went to the cross. And he went down into the grave. And then he rose again on the third day. And because he rose again on the third day, his spirit was able to be poured out on the day of Pentecost 50 days later. So it tells me this simple revelation that if we are willing to go to the garden in the mindset of the garden to say that not my will but yours be done, there's going to be a great outpouring of God's spirit as an end result of that. Because if Jesus would not have defeated the flesh in the garden, there may never have been a Pentecost. That's right. So we must first, as a representative, if we want to impact the world that we are representing, or that we are uh, representative of, we need to be in the mindset to put our will and our agenda to the side. That's right. The second, it says, in order for an individual to properly represent their kingdom, they must fully believe in have a knowledge of and an understanding of their country's constitution. Amen. We must understand the word of God. 2 Timothy 2 and 15. It's a scripture we've read before talking about the word of God. He says there in 2 Timothy 2 and, and verse number 15, he says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. Amen. While we are being uh, representatives of this world, of the kingdom of God in this world, there's going to be strong delusions that are going to come our way. There's going to be temptations that are going to be there. There's going to be stumbling blocks that are placed before us to detour us from the plan that God has for us to impact us. It's, it would be easy if you're in a place where the culture seems very attractive to you. It would be easy to become enthralled with the culture and the rules of that world, even if they're different than the country you came from. But an ambassador must understand and believe and have a firm love for the constitution of the country they're coming from. You must study to show yourself approved. That's, you want Bible for why you need to study the word? There's your Bible right there. So you're not deceived when you're on a mission. Amen. You show yourself approved. Hebrews 4 and 12 is another scripture that we read a lot talking about the word of God. But it says that for the word of God, our, our, this is our constitution. The Bible is our constitution, if you will. It says for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joint and marrow. And as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It is important that when we are being bombarded by the world's pressure and the world's culture and the world's mindset, that we understand that the Spirit of God does not lie, the Word of God is true to the very end, and we can stand on it to be true. And so even when things don't align up, even when our mind doesn't align up with the Word of God, the Word of God is still right. Because there's going to be times where it's going to, you're going to be easily deceived if you don't know the Word. And you're going to fall away from the mission that God has sent you on. Amen. Don't buy into the new culture where you are 
station. Man. Number three, an ambassador, and this is particularly in the monarchy, which we worship in the King of Kings, so I'm going to use the monarchy example of an ambassador. The ambassador is not voted in. The ambassador is not the most popular choice, always. The ambassador is chosen by the king. And as a representative of the king, we are chosen by the king. And we read that and it says, but we are a chosen generation, yes, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Why? Why did he call us out to be, why did he choose us? What did he choose us to do? So that we could show forth the praises of him who have called us out of darkness and to his marvelous light. We are ambassadors. And we are chosen by him to do such a work. Verse number, or that was number four, point number four. Says that this is huge. This is one of the oaths that you sign. This is a rule. It's treason in most places if you, do, if you disobey this law. It says that you must, listen to this, you must as an ambassador and representative of your kingdom, you must never, ever become a citizen of the state that you are assigned to. We are in this world, but we're not of the world. The Bible says, look not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And it says that that passes away. But he that doeth the will of God, what? Will abide forever. Amen. Bible says in... 2 Corinthians 6 and 16 says, Come out from among them and be separate, separate people. Yeah. Touch not the unclean thing. We use that a lot to, to prove our, you know, push our ideas and our standards and stuff like that. But I'm telling you, this is just spiritual command right now. It says, You need to come out. Don't be part of this world, even though you're in the world. You are a representative of the different world. And then there's a good reason why coming up. Because number point number five, one of the beautiful things about an ambassador is you are not dependent on the economic status of the country that you're at or the economic condition of the country you are assigned to, but your wealth and your uh, all of your needs come from your kingdom. Aren't you glad that the Bible says that my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory? The God that we serve, his arm is not short that it cannot reach. His ear is not deaf that it cannot hear. He's our provider. If you have struggles, you can have a peace that would pass your understanding. And then our troubles, and the troubles in this life are not uh, a direct reflection of where we are gaining our providers from. And then it says in Matthew 6 and 31, it says don't worry basically. It says don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. When we're in this world and we're a representative of the kingdom of God, we don't have to worry about if the bank account's getting a little low. We don't have to beg on a street corner because God will take care of us. Amen. That's true. Amen. We're not dependent on this world. We're dependent on the king of kings and the Lord of lords. When the doctor says, I've done all that I can do, we're not to 
we serve. But when we're talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you are the one that is unlo- you are the one that may be unlovable to this world, but to him he can't stop loving you. His love is unconditional. He said, what shall separate me from the love of Christ? He said, nay, the, the persecution of him and the nakedness of peril. So he said, no. And all of these things, listen, and all of my trials, and all of my struggles, I am more than a conqueror through him that loves me. So I am persuaded. Why is he persuaded? Because he understands that he's not bound by the laws of this world, but through the King of Kings and through the Lord of he is more than a conqueror through him that loves him. And that's why he stood up and said, with such a surety and with such boldness, he was able to say that I'm persuaded that nothing shall separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. He said that no weapon formed against you will prosper. Amen. You are more than a We have diplomatic immunity as a representative of the kingdom of God, and I'm so thankful for that today. But point number seven, I'm going to stay here until the end. This is the last point I want to talk about. It's awesome. We've been healed. We've been delivered. We've been saved. We've been set free from bondage. We've been set free from all addictions of, of, of this world, and we've become a representative of the kingdom of God. We've become a new creature, and we have this light that he's shown in us. But the number one role, the number one purpose, we must never forget our purpose, right? Without a vision, the people perish. We must never forget what our purpose is. The primary purpose of an ambassador, a representative of the kingdom of God, is simply this. To influence his territory on behalf of his kingdom. I mean, Matthew 9. If you turn there, and I'm going to be jumping around to a couple of scriptures real quick, because he's given us a commission here. Matthew 9 and 35. He, he saved us, yes, but then he commissioned us to go out and do a work for him. Matthew 9 and 35. If you want to put that up on the screen. So Matthew 9 and 35, he goes on to say in that scripture, he says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of what? Of his kingdom? Of the kingdom. Okay. Talk about the, the Son of Man, Christ Jesus, right there. We are to preach of the kingdom of God. And then what did he do? He healed every sickness and every disease among the people. That is what we are to do. We went about, we were to go about preaching the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is that Jesus came and died and rose again so that we could have life. That's what the good news is. It's great news. We've embraced that good news. Now we need to take that good news to this world. We are representative. Mark 16, and verse number 15. says that, He said unto them, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to everyone that you like. Say, go preach the gospel to every creature. That's sometimes hard for me. But listen, how about the large joint? So, without measure. Do I believe in hell or not? You know, I do. Otherwise, I wouldn't be, you know, living this life. I believe that there is a place that we are going to go if we choose to reject this gospel. And I think there's a lot of people out there that need this gospel that don't know about it. And some people, some people have heard the news. They've heard about Jesus Christ, but it wasn't the good news. They've heard about that if you do this, you're going to go to hell. If you do that, you're going to go to hell. If you do this, you're going to hell. They've heard the convicting news. But we've got something greater than that. We've got the good news. And that, you know what, yeah, I know you messed up. And I know you failed. But that's okay. Just get back up and keep moving. That's the good news. The good news says that by his stripes, I am healed. Not just physically, but spiritually. We fail. But a just man falls seven times and he gets back up. And then, that's the good news. The good news is that we don't have to listen to the doctor's report. That says that you've got three months living. That's the good news. The good news is that Jesus came and died so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. Maybe not in this world, but in the world we're going to. Don't store up treasures in this earth. 
in this world where things decay and the moth eats it up and rust takes care of it. But he says, store your treasures in heaven. He's willing to prepare a place for you and for me. That's the good news. And then, and the rest will work itself out. Because I promise you this, when someone falls in love with Jesus Christ, they'll want to gladly give up the things that are contrary to him. That's not our job. Our job is to introduce them to Jesus Christ. The Bible says that you have the salt of the earth. What does salt do to you? Salt makes me thirsty. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Our job is to let people know that there is a God that loves them and live a lifestyle, being a representative of his kingdom, that would cause people to just desire him to the point that he would fill them with his spirit and change their life forever. Amen. Amen. And then the last scripture I have, it's a little lengthy, I'm not probably going to read it all, but we want to talk about how do you show this love to people? You talk about how are, you, how are we to be a representative of the kingdom of God? How do we share this love of God with people? And he tells us in Matthew 25, he says that when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, that he shall sit upon the throne of glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them, the, she uh, the shepherd divided the sheep from the goats, and, and he shall set the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left. Then the king shall say unto them on the right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom that is prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? Because when I was hunger, you gave me meat. When I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. Sick, and you visited me. Uh, visited me while I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then the righteousness shall answer, saying, Lord, we didn't see the hunger. When did we feed thee? When did we give you drink? And they go on and say, we don't understand this. He says, when you were sick or in prison, and we came unto thee, and it says, and the king shall answer them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. We are going into a season about giving gifts. We like to receive gifts, and if you're, you know, most people like to give gifts. Makes you feel good to, to bless somebody else. Let's not forget about giving the greatest gift of all. The love of Christ. Whether it be through our Bible study with them, teaching them, you know, preaching to them, that's one way to represent the kingdom. Maybe coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But what's the other way? By showing them the love. Going to where they're at. Giving to them while they're in need. Being a true representative of the kingdom of God. To the point that he separated those that did it and those that didn't. It's important. As a representative that we help those that are in need. I know that the, the red flag goes up. And, we, and I'm guilty that when we see the guy on the corner. And he's got a sign up saying I need food for my three children. And he's got a pack of cigarettes in his pocket and a cigarette in his mouth. I know that our natural instinct is to say but let me tell you something. Those, those people need the love of God just like you. Not saying you gotta go give them hundred dollars, but you can go buy a sandwich from McDonald's for ninety nine cents. If that you consider that food. Some people do, some people don't. But it's pretty important that we love our brothers. Now, I'm not saying you can help everybody. We can't help everybody. But we, we can help one person. If each one of us can help one person, yeah. think about how much better this community would be. Yeah. And do it, listen, do it is up to him. Yeah. Here's the answer. If we do it so that we can get recognition, whether it be as an individual or as a church body, then we miss the point. Yeah. The point is not to fill this room with people so that we can say we have this room filled with people. The purpose is to get this room filled with people because people are running in because they recognize that there is a loving God that desires them and wants them. Even though they may stink, even though they may be socially unacceptable, they may be a doctor. They just at one time believed so much in science that he couldn't not battle God, but he's found himself in a, a complex situation and he doesn't understand it because the medical books don't say anything about it. Listen, I'm not talking about all men. Right. Rich and poor, black and white, right. of all nations, all kindreds and tongues. Yeah. He wants us to represent his kingdom oh, yeah. and share this love of God and preach to, to every nation and to every 
preacher. I mean, what a wonderful season we can make this, this Christmas season, this giving season, if we gave the love of God to everyone they came in contact with. There's no greater gift. The batteries are going to run out of the toys. The game systems are going to be outdated. The clothes are going to wear out. But His love is unmeasurable and unsettable. And why don't we all stand to our feet? Praise God. Father, we just ask you right now that you would help us as we are setting out on this journey today. God, I pray that we would draw a line in the sand and say, Lord, from this moment on, I'm not about my business anymore, but Lord, I want to become a fisher of men, Lord. I want to be about your business. I want to be a representative of your kingdom, God. And Lord, I pray that as a church congregation, as this global assembly and this body, God, leaves these four walls today, God, that we would not forget about you, God, and go on about our pain, but Lord, that you would help us to always be about your business, God, to be sensitive unto every opportunity and every open door. And I pray that, Lord, as we begin to recognize when you've opened the door, that we would have the boldness, God, and the strength and the, and Lord, the confidence in you to step through that door and do a tremendous work for your kingdom, God. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us and, and uh, encourage us today. We give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. And then why don't we just give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. I pray that this will find you a place of fertile power. And that you will be forever transformed and forever changed by the love of Jesus Christ. Not by my words, but by his words. Not by my plan, but by his plan. Not by my message, but by his message. Lord, I pray that you will reach this community now. Lord, with your love, help us to be a beacon of light in this dark world now. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. And then we've got a few minutes. The kids are coming down right now. We're getting ready to start the second service. So if you will just join up with us in just a moment, we're, we're going to transfer.